today we'll talk about uh, public economics to start with and starting with uh, public good so who can tell me what uh, public good is does no, no one knows um, okay so a public good um, you have the you can see the, the classification of goods uh, on the table so public good is a good that is non-rival meaning that the enjoyment of the good by someone doesn't prevent the enjoyment of the good by someone else and it is non-excludable in the sense that we cannot prevent someone from accessing the good okay so along the lines of uh, rivalry non-rivalry and excludability or not uh, there are four types of goods and some goods are in between because they share like mixed characteristics so the the good that we typically think of are private goods like food clothing etc they are rival and excludable meaning that uh, if i eat the apple you cannot eat the apple and um, it's excludable in the sense that it's easy to, to prevent you from having the the apple like uh, if I put some, some guards uh, in front of my store and uh, something like that. Then there are uh, excludable goods that are non-rival, like uh, going to the cinema, to a theater, uh, daycare centers, things like that. So there is a, a barrier to, a physical barrier to access in the sense that you have to pay to enter. Uh, so th there is a mechanism to, to prevent anyone from just uh, grabbing the good uh, but it is non-rival in the sense that uh, uh, me going to the theater doesn't prevent you to you go to the theater as well at least to a certain extent because uh, if it's full then it becomes a bit rival and then there are non excludable goods uh, where access cannot be avoided and some are non-rival this is the case of public good and here the example uh, which is in the table is a uh, clean air um, so every good has a cost it's it's costly to um, ensure that the air is of good quality it's costly to uh, build and run a theater etc uh, but some goods are non-excludable in the sense that uh, I cannot uh, make you pay to benefit from the clean air and impose you uh, poor hair if you don't pay. So in the sense, uh, public good will we, we require a special type of regulations. And then there is a fourth type of good which are rival and non excludable and they are called common pool resources. And the example here is fish stocks. We can also think uh, of uh, groundwater. Uh, so if you pump the, the water in the ground and there is a you know a limited amount of water uh, you, you subtract water from what I can take and it's not easily preventable uh, that uh, that I cannot easily impede you from from uh, pumping the water same similarly I cannot easily prevent you to, to fishing uh, in the oceans and, and fish stocks are to some extent uh, depletable so um, public goods um, should be provided in general by the public sector because um, of the, the tragedy of the, of the commons that, uh, that if um, that it's in the interest of everyone not to pay for the good because they know that uh, if the others pay uh, what they can pay additionally it will not change much to uh, for example clean air or uh, we can think of other examples afterwards but um, but the, 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 the people uh, would like that uh, everybody pays and the tragedy of the commons says that uh, nobody will pay if uh, we rely on private and voluntary contributions uh, before uh, going forward, can you think of other examples of public goods?
So I recall, a public good is a good which all enjoy in common, in the sense that each individual's consumption of such a good leads to no subtraction from any other individual's consumption of that good. No idea? Yes? So you said testing for COVID, actually uh, herd immunity would be a public good because we all enjoy uh, herd immunity and uh, yeah, it's non rival. Another example. Okay, so here are more examples. So a lighthouse, so it, it benefits all boats and uh, you cannot prevent a boat from uh, using from the, the light. Uh, similarly, street lighting. Knowledge is a very important uh, public good because to a large extent, knowledge is uh, freely available. Uh, security, like uh, national defense uh, or the, the security um, brought by uh, police. Clean air, air immunity. We have cell already radio frequencies as well. You can air the radio uh, without paying. Um, unless there is a tax. And, um, and this is why public goods will require taxes. Yes? No, if there is a patent uh, or copyright, then uh, it is excludable. It is still non-rival because uh, I can uh, use the, the knowledge uh, without preventing you from using the knowledge, but it, the patents make it excludable, or the property rights make it excludable. Uh, this is why I, I included free software. So uh, it's hard to, because software in general, it's excludable. So free software, they, the, the creator made the choice that it's not excludable. So I'm not sure if it's really not excludable or uh, if it's uh, by choice. So it, maybe it's in between. But, uh, but there are large uh, parts of knowledge uh, that you cannot put uh, copyright on, or if you put copyright on, it's, it's very hard to enforce. For example, um, many countries developed, like including the Soviet Union, uh, China, but also Western countries uh, in, in earlier days, um, by uh, not applying copyright laws, and, uh, and br like bringing uh, technology from abroad uh, without having to pay for it. It was a very important uh, motor for, for development. And uh, yeah. So, um, so here is the, the stylized uh, model. I took the, the simplest example to, to show you some math. So the utility of individual I um, is increasing in the public good. Uh, so, and, and the individual I contributes CI to the public good. This is the cost they pay. And uh, so it's decreasing in CI and increasing in the sum of the contribution, uh, which is uh, the provision of the public good. For example, if you think of uh, security, it's the sum uh, of uh, taxes or another uh, mean uh, where everyone has contributed to fund security. And I put a square root to, to show that there are decreasing returns to the public good. So um, the, the first expression, it's uh, from the point of view of individual I. So uh, there is the, the cost, uh, which is kind of independent of uh, the, the public good. And then the second equivalent expression is from the point of view of the social planner. Uh, I assume that all individuals are identical. And so the provision of the public good is just n times uh, the contribution of an individual. So if you uh, maximize uh, this uh, contribution from the point of view of the individual, uh, you will find the competitive equilibrium, which is that uh, the contribution is one over n. Uh, okay, because uh, the, the individual contributes uh, only one over n to uh, the public good, and um, and when you you compute the, the first order uh, 
condition equal to zero, um, then you you find that the person, the, the individual, does not internalize uh, the fact that actually everyone will reason the same way as they are uh, optimizing, and so everyone will uh, contribute the same one over n, uh, which will make a total contribution of n. But if you optimize from the point of view of the social planner, you find that the optimal contribution is n, so that the total contribution is uh, n to the power 2. And, uh, um, and this is because uh, the contribution of someone is not independent from the contribution of someone else in this case. And uh, here you, you take into account the positive externality that the contribution of someone brings to the utility of the others. The Samuelson conditions state that for a public good, the marginal cost of the public good, which, is, which here is equal to n, because the, if anyone's uh, marginal contribution is 1, then the, the additional cost for society is n, should be equal to the sum of the marginal benefits for all the individuals. So here it's equal to 1 for each individual. And it's different from the condition of optimality for the provision of the private good. Because there is just the marginal benefit which is equal to the marginal cost. Okay, because there is no externality from uh, the contribution of someone. It's just benefit themselves. So I'm not... You have questions on the math? It's, it's very... Uh, it's going very fast. But um, what is important to remember is that uh, there is a free riding problem if uh, everyone is selfish for providing a public good because each one is better off by contributing minimally and enjoying others' contribution. Okay, Lindahl in uh, the early uh, 20th century noticed that the optimal provision of a public good could be attained by taxing each individual at their marginal benefits. According to this formula, you would get uh, the sum of marginal benefit as the tax, and this would finance um, the public good. The problem is how can we reveal the marginal benefits of people? People will have an interest to lie and say that uh, actually they don't benefit from the public good, so that they let the others pay. So. Um, there is a, a mechanism, the Vickray-Clark-Groves mechanism, that is strategy-proof, so people do not lie. Um, and they, so they reveal their marginal benefits. The issue with this mechanism is that it doesn't collect enough funding to finance the public good. Okay, I can give you more details on this mechanism if you want. Um, if there are some mechanisms that bring enough funding, uh, there is one, which is incentive compatible uh, in expectation, um, but it has a big problem. It doesn't uh, guarantee that people will participate. So people will, will start by revealing their marginal benefit, and then when we ask them to pay, they will say, no, finally, I don't pay. So, so basically, there is no good uh, solution to reveal the um, the. the individual benefits of a public good, and uh, we have to resort to uh, proxy, to approximation, uh, which usually is uh, the fact that, uh, okay, we'll make everybody pay the same uh, through taxation, uh, or we will make uh, the rich pay more because uh, maybe they have to redistribute, but, um, or we'll make uh, someone living in such city pay more. Um, but, uh, yeah. Are there some questions? Yes? Uh, I just want to have a comment on this one because uh, from my uh, learning from the neuroeconomics and this that maybe we can observe some brain activities or neural activities for, the, uh, for everyone's preference. Then they can benefit or balance which 
uh, what is the true utility of this people. And then they can say, okay, uh, maybe there can be no free writing problem, because they, they can examine their brain, brain activity. If they, the brain activity, for example, if, if there's a positive one, and then they do not say, okay, they truly like this public good, but they just lie to us. They, they don't need this, so they, they maybe pay less, but actually they need this. So maybe in the future, if there's something related to the neuroeconomics, maybe can solve this problem. <laughs> okay. So the, for those who don't hear, who haven't heard on, a, heard on, on Zoom, the idea is to, to go directly to observe the brain of people to, to measure uh, what they truly like. So people, uh, it's like a lying detector. We, they, cannot, uh, they cannot lie or we can see where they lie. So... It's still in the process. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's very futuristic. Not sure it's, uh, so maybe it solves some problem. I'm not sure it's, it doesn't create other problems to have this type of technology available. But uh, yes, it's also very costly probably to, to run this on, uh, on many people. But yeah, in the, yeah, for available technology, actually, we don't have <laughs> this possibility. But uh, yeah, why not? Any other question? Okay, so now I'm going uh, to talk about uh, optimal taxation. So William Vicray was the first to formulate the problem of uh, the optimal labor income taxation. So the idea is that in principle, if you have a utilitarian social welfare function, because the marginal utility uh, is con the utility function of each individual is concave. In principle, you would prefer to redistribute all income equally to everyone. Uh, this is what maximizes uh, social welfare, because the marginal utility of a rich is lower than the marginal utility of a poor, so you always want to redistribute from the rich to the poor. The issue is that if you do that, then uh, the rich may stop working, or they may avoid taxes, um, or they may uh, move to another country, so that uh, taxing the rich too much will actually not help you to, to raise revenues. Uh, there may be a point above which taxing, increasing the, the tax rates will actually decrease revenue collection. Uh, this is what we call the, the Laffer curve. So if you have uh, the tax rate on the x-axis and the revenue collected on the y-axis, it is like a hemp curve, and you have like a, a maximum uh, a tax rate that gives you the maximum tax revenues. If you go beyond, then the, the, the state, uh, the government loses money. So the idea is to find uh, the good balance between equity and efficiency so that you can redistribute from the rich to the poor, increasing uh, welfare, decreasing inequalities, but in an efficient way that doesn't uh, kill the incentives to, to work or to uh, contribute uh, too much. So the way that uh, Vicre uh, modeled this is the following. Workers differ by their productivity theta which is unobservable to the social planner and distributed with a function f, probability distribution. Uh, a worker with productivity theta works h hours and earns a wage uh, equals to theta times h. So if you want productivity is the uh, hourly wage, but the the government doesn't observe hours, so it doesn't observe productivity either. Just observe the earnings. Then each worker optimizes their labor supply. So their utility is increasing in their earnings, theta h, and decreasing in the amount of work, h. So they maximize the, their number of hours, given the, taking as given the um, income tax rates, the income tax rate schedules. And this leads to a distribution of earnings, f hat. Now, the objective of the social planner 
uh, is utilitarian, let's say. So is the sum of the utilities of all agents, which here writes as an integral uh, with the, the, the probability uh, f uh, that uh, the, the individual is of type uh, theta. And uh, the social planner maximizes with respect to the income tax schedule, which is a function t of the earnings. So the maximization program is here. The utility is uh, the earnings minus taxes. And it also depends on the hours. So the ideal solution would be to tax people in function of productivity directly. Because um, then you could tax uh, uh, highly productive people more, and uh, they could not uh, pretend that they are uh, a low productivity type, and uh, then obtain low taxation. You could uh, tax them a lot to force them to, to work hard, basically. But productivity is not observed, so we are uh, in a second best world. We have to tax income, which is the observed uh, variable. This results in tax distortion. The tax distortion is the disincentive to work. So because of uh, this taxation, which is not lump sum, people would work, will work less than uh, without taxation, or in the first best case. Are there questions on this? Uh, um, so, so you see that this setting uh, uses the um, apparatus of mechanism design uh, that would work forward in, in game theory. And uh, a lot of economics, uh, macroeconomic theory nowadays, uses this concept of mechanism design with uh, the types that are not observed and uh, the information that should be revealed through a mechanism. Here the mechanism is the income tax rates. So Merlis got the Nobel Prize for solving this problem. And uh, I will present the solution of this problem by Emmanuel Saez, which is uh, much more elegant and uh, give the solution in terms of elasticities that are directly measurable. Um, before that, just uh, two words on the assumptions of the model. You have the assumption that there is an intrinsic productivity uh, of each person uh, and that these productivities vary. So this is somewhat a crude assumption because uh, in reality the productivity is somehow endogenous on the education received uh, and it can be changed depending on the circumstances and so on. The second assumption is the utility function because uh, it assumes that uh, we have that people have all the same utility function that it has a certain shape and this is uh, this assumption that will help the um, economist to recover the underlying distribution of um, of productivity that is unobserved uh, because the, other, uh, the only distribution that is observed is the distribution of earnings f hat. And then there is a last assumption which is an ethical assumption that we want to maximize the sum of uh, all uh, utilities of agent. We could take uh, other uh, ethical assumptions, for example the libertarian assumption would be uh, that the social planner doesn't maximize anything so it doesn't tax it lets the, the people uh, interact uh, freely. Uh, you could have a Rolgen ethical assumption that what we want to maximize is the utility of the person with the lowest utility level, which will result in the slightly uh, more progressive, so slightly more redistributive uh, income tax rates. Um, now, um, says um, solve the problem in terms of elasticities. In particular, the elasticity of earnings with respect to the marginal tax rate, or actually with respect to the net of tax rates, which is I mi 1 minus the marginal tax rate uh, T prime. So the elasticity EY 
is how much the earnings vary when you uh, increase the tax rate, the marginal tax rate. So um, the marginal tax rate, do you know the difference between the, the average tax rate and the marginal tax rate? So the, um, say you have an income of like uh, 3,000 francs, maybe you pay uh, 1,000 uh, in taxes, so your average tax rate is 33%, but your marginal tax rate it may be 50% because if you earn an additional franc, you will be taxed 50% uh, on this additional franc. Okay, this is the derivative of the income tax. And uh, the idea is that uh, people who earn an income Y will reduce uh, their working hours if the marginal tax rate increases at this income level because it means that they will be taxed more on the last francs that they earn, which changes their um, trade-off between uh, labor supply and leisure. As uh, labor will not um, be rewarded as much as before, then uh, people will uh, consume more leisure. Okay, so this is at the source of the equity efficiency trade-off. Now, consider a small reform that we call delta T, in which the module tax rate is increased by delta tau between the income Y and the income Y plus dy, and nothing else uh, happens in the rest of the income distributions. So this is what this uh, small tax reform looks like. Uh, so in science paper, what uh, I call Y equal it's Z, and on the x-axis you have the before tax income, and on the y-axis the after tax income, and you see that uh, the slope doesn't change uh, between the before reform, which is the uh, uh, the upper line and uh, the post reform, which is the dashed line, except between y and y plus dy, where uh, the tax rate, the marginal tax rate, increases by a bit. So, as I said, in this interval, there is a substitution uh, from labor to leisure, uh, which makes people work less. And above this uh, income level, y plus dy, the marginal tax rate doesn't change. So if you work an additional uh, hour, you will be taxed the same. So you don't have uh, any incentive to change your uh, optimization on this regard, but you will earn less. And in this regard, you have an incentive to work more uh, and this is the income effect, okay? Because you want uh, uh, to satisfy a, a certain level of consumption, so as your average tax rate increases, uh, you prefer to work a bit more, because in a sense, it's like uh, reducing your, uh, your budget, and, uh, and so you, you, if you enjoyed as much leisure as before, it would mean that uh, you enjoy less consumption as before, and this is uh, not optimal because uh, you could rather decrease the consumption of leisure by a bit and decrease the consumption of material goods by a bit instead of decreasing the consumption of material goods by a lot and not decreasing leisure. Okay. Um, so in the um, in this uh, simplified uh, exposition of uh, the model, I will uh, assume a weigh income effects. So I will only consider the effect that reduce uh, the labor supply and not the effect that increases it. Um, and you'll see uh, that we can derive a formula for the income tax rate. So, the only people that will 
to change their labor supply following the small tax reform are those between Y and Y plus DY. They will reduce their labor supply due to the substitution effect. So there are FY, DY people in this interval and they reduce their income by this amount, delta Y, which is equal to the elasticity uh, times uh, this term. So to, to understand why uh, it writes like this, you just isolate the term dy in the formula of the elasticity and uh, you rename it uh, delta y because uh, the tax increases by delta tau and not by uh, an infinitesimal amount. Um, are there any questions at this stage? Okay, so now you have um, several effects on um, the revenues that the government collects. You have a mechanical effect that dy delta tau is collected from each taxpayer above y. And there are y minus f hat taxpayers above y. Okay. So here we assume that uh, there is no income effect. So all people here will work as much as before, not more. Uh, not, uh, yeah. And uh, they will pay dy delta tau more taxes. And then there is uh, the substitution effect that I talked about. So the extra revenue collected, dr, is equal to uh, the mechanical term, dy delta tau times uh, the number of taxpayer above y, y minus f hat, uh, minus the substitution effect, which is equal to uh, delta y uh, times uh, f hat of y, number of concerned uh, taxpayers. And now we assume that this extra revenue is redistributed lump sum, meaning that each uh, taxpayer will receive an equal share of this extra revenue. This is an important assumption because if we didn't redistribute it equally, it would mean that uh, the marginal tax rate will change at another uh, place in the distribution because it would mean that the after-tax uh, and transfers uh, income would change, uh, <coughs> uh, the, the slope of this would change at uh, another um, place than uh, between y and y plus dy. So here, as there is no income effect, this uh, increase in the marginal increase in the revenue of everyone has no effect on the labor supply, and uh, the formula is much easier to compute. So then, the utility of an individual of productivity theta changes by delta uh, u, which is equal to the marginal utility of consumption of this person, times what they receive, dr. So here we assume that the mass of people is one. We don't say that there are n people, we say that there is one people, so it's why it's dr and not dr over n and uh, minus uh, the extra taxes they pay if their income is above y. So now for this perturbation mo uh, method, to the, the important step is the, in the derivation of the formula is the observation that at the optimum, the net welfare effect is zero meaning that the sum of the changes in utility is equal to zero. And why is it so? Because if it was not the case, uh, it would mean that uh, you could change, you could, there would be a small reform uh, that could increase social welfare. Okay? So it would mean you are not at the optimum, at the optimum. At the optimum, uh, you cannot improve uh, the, the change in welfare, uh, which means that uh, this integral of the change in welfare is equal to zero. And uh, plugging um, 
uh, delta u uh, here in this formula, plugging uh, delta r again, and uh, rearranging provides the optimal tax formula that you can see here. So I'm going to comment a bit on this formula. Uh, first, it's expressed as uh, in terms of the marginal tax rate, and actually the marginal tax rate divided by y minus itself. But this is not a problem. We could isolate the marginal tax rates and integrate. It would just make the, the formula more complicated. You see that uh, the marginal tax rate is increasing in the share of people that are above y. So if there are uh, a lot of people uh, above y, it means that uh, the mechanical effect will be large. So you want to uh, increase the tax uh, rates more. But it is decreasing in the number of people at y. Because uh, the number of people at y um, contribute to the substitution effect. So we lower their working hours, lower the revenue collected. It's also decreasing in the elasticity of earnings with respect to the net of tax rate, meaning that uh, if people's uh, working hours are inelastic, uh, it means that uh, there is no equity efficiency trade-off. You can tax them a lot, they will uh, work as much as before, so you can actually tax uh, them a lot. Actually, at least if you need it, and whether you need to tax people or not for ethical reason is given by this term, y minus uh, g over bar, where g is the average welfare weight uh, for people above y. So it's the average of uh, the delta u. So if uh, y is very high, then the marginal utility of consumption above y is very low, and uh, the, the weight you give to the, the, the very rich is uh, close to zero, uh, meaning that this term will be high and you will tax them a lot, and vice versa for the poor. Are there any questions? Now, here is what the formula looks like. So this is taken from uh, the paper by Saez in 2001. It optimizes um, the labor income tax in the US, uh, including income effect. So the formula is actually a bit more complicated than the one I've showed. And uh, here it takes two different values for the elasticity uh, EY that equals uh, zeta C, uh, 0.25 and 0.5. These are like the the, the common range uh, found where in the literature that tries to measure this elasticity. Um, in, uh, in dashed line, it's not important. It's the optimal linear tax schedule. If, uh, if the tax rate uh, is um, forced to be, the marginal tax rate is forced to be the same across the income distribution uh, for the different levels of uh, elasticity. And so, what you see here, um, okay, I haven't updated the slide, but um, there is a, this is not complete to understand the tax system. You also need to know the lump sum transfers, so the basic income that people receive. Because here you collect taxes, and as I said, they are redistributed equally among everyone. And I think, uh, if I remember correctly, that says finds uh, that it's, I don't remember or if it's 40 or 60% uh, of the average income, uh, which is the optimal basic income. Um, and uh, so let's say this basic income is uh, 2,000 francs. Um, then the marginal tax rate is very high uh, when you earn nothing. Meaning that uh, you, you earn, uh, if you earn nothing by yourself, you receive 2,000 francs from the government. And uh, if you earn uh, 1,000 francs uh, by yourself, um, this means that uh, you're taxed at, uh, let's say, 70, 80% on these first 1,000 francs. 
So you earn, uh, after tax, uh, seven, uh, no, sorry, 30 hundred francs additionally to your basic income of 2,000. So if you work nothing, you, work, you earn 2,000. If you work to earn 1,000, you earn in the end 2,300. Then for the middle class, the marginal tax rates decreases because there is a lot of people in the middle class. So we don't want to disincentive them to work too much. And then the marginal tax rates increases again for the very rich uh, because it brings a lot uh, of revenues uh, to, to do so. And uh, we don't care so much about their welfare. And so um, Saez finds optimal tax rates uh, for the top uh, incomes between 70 and 80%. Are there questions? No question? Okay. Do these uh, results surprise you, or? Yeah, so, um, yeah. Uh, do you, you talking about low incomes or high incomes? High income. Yeah, depending on the elasticity, it's between uh, yeah, 65, uh, 75, 80%, yeah. It's much higher than the rates that the current rates. Uh, I know uh, no country today that um, that taxes uh, so much uh, high incomes, uh, which shows that probably uh, most countries are under taxing uh, the high incomes with respect to the optimal tax rates. Uh, historically, it was not always the case. For example, right after the World War II, in many countries, including the U.S. Uh, the top marginal tax rates were very high. In the US, uh, Roosevelt wanted to have a maximal income, so 100% marginal tax rate for the, the top uh, incomes, but uh, the Congress um, uh, didn't want, and they find a compromise, compromise with 95% uh, uh, of uh, top marginal income tax rates. And uh, it was during the, the 50s that this uh, rate prevailed and it doesn't prevent uh, growth in the US, which uh, confirms that uh, actually uh, the equity efficiency trade-off, even if it exists, um, it doesn't justify to have, uh, um, I mean, it justifies to have uh, higher uh, top tax rates that we currently have. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, this I've done it last time. Now I'm going to talk about economic history. So two Nobel Prize uh, were given, or maybe we make the pause right now, if you want. Five minute pause. Economic history is uh, the study of uh, history using economic concept. Um, and it also um, uh, improve economic knowledge through uh, the lessons from the past. So two Nobels were awarded for in economic history, Robert Fogel and uh, Douglas North, who are both um, important in funding the cliometrics field, which is the application of statistical methods, so rigorous economic uh, analysis, to historical data. So Fogel um, became famous with his uh, study on railroads because he, his conclusion, after a very detailed analysis, was against the established uh, wisdom. He said that, uh, contrary to a view that was made popular by a guy named Rostow, railroads didn't really help uh, for economic development that much in the 19th century. So Rostow said that uh, railroads were uh, crucial for the Industrial Revolution because uh, they opened up new areas 
for farming, uh, access to, uh, to new markets, and uh, was also a big uh, source of demand to develop the steel and iron industry to build the rails. So Fogel contests uh, this idea by uh, running a counterfactual analysis. So he asked the what if case, basically what would have happened if railroads were not developed. Um, and in this counterfactual scenario, he finds that the GDP would have been just 3% lower in 1890 uh, if there would have been no railroads, but just canals and roads and, uh, and rivers and, uh, and horses to move uh, people and merchandises. So he compares the cost of uh, transportation of the different methods and uh, he finds that actually uh, transport by horses or canals uh, is not that uh, more expensive than through rails and he finds that okay maybe the patterns of development would have been different uh, maybe the midwest wouldn't have developed uh, um, so fast uh, but there would have been a, a stronger development uh, in the east coast and it wouldn't have changed much so his method uh, of statistical analysis counterfactual question um, was really original and uh, and had a strong legacy, but uh, his result is not contested because uh, it's not only a question of, uh, of cost to transport some good, but also the speed at which the good is transported, the quality uh, of, of the, the delivery, uh, like uh, the, the train is more secure, uh, there is less attacks, um, the, the, the good has uh, less chances to fall apart, etc. So, um, so, so there are, I mean, the, this is still debated nowadays, uh, the importance of railroads, but uh, many say that uh, it was indeed important, it steered innovation uh, for new machines, etc. Then uh, it made an even more uh, controversial uh, book, Time on the Cross, with uh, co author Engerman, uh, about slavery where he argued that slavery was efficient. And, um, okay, let me quote, the, the typical slave field hand was not lazy, inept, or unproductive. On average, he was harder working and more efficient than his white counterpart. This is because the material, not psychological, conditions of the lives of slaves compared favorably with those of free industrial workers. The typical slave field hand received about 90% of the income he produced. Um, so this is what he finds after uh, exploring, uh, like after collecting a lot of data on, on, on slaves and uh, analyzing them statistically. But uh, this shows that if slavery was efficient, then it wouldn't have disappeared by itself and because it is uh, immoral, then you needed the civil war to end slavery. So saying that slavery is economically efficient is not a justification for slavery. On the contrary, for him, it was a way to justify the civil war. And, uh, but, but his uh, result that uh, the slaves were in better material conditions than the free workers could be surprising. Uh, he argues that uh, it shouldn't be surprising because uh, the owner of a plant, of a, a company with free workers, doesn't care if their worker die, uh, like uh, if, if their working conditions are so bad that uh, they are in very poor, poor health, that there are a lot of accidents, or that they cannot be fed uh, sufficiently with their low wages. But the owner of a slave, uh, they want to preserve their assets because if the slave is undernourished uh, or is mistreated, then it's, uh, it's, it's a loss of value for the owner of the slave. It means that um, 
the, the owner cannot sell the slave uh, for a good price uh, and, uh, and this gives incentive to the owner to not uh, treat the slaves too harshly. Um, this stirred up a controversy as you can imagine and actually uh, another historian, Gutmann, uh, also uh, prepared uh, extensive work on, on slavery and showed how badly slaves were treated. They were regularly whipped. Uh, rape was uh, a widespread way to, to dominate a uh, women's slave. Uh, families were separated, uh, etc. And uh, actually, uh, Fogel felt obliged uh, 20 years later to uh, write another book to explain that, uh, yes, indeed, the slaves uh, were badly treated and uh, to put some uh, water on his wine um, eh, from the, the first book. So his views uh, didn't survive, but uh, the legacy, uh, again, is the method. Uh, the economic data collection and statistical analysis uh, to this data is uh, now a very big uh, uh, way to conduct uh, economic history. Uh, Fogel also explored the relationships between nutrition, health, and productivity on a very long period. Um, so, at the time of the French Revolution, the typical French men weighed about 50 kilos, and the English men, who were a bit richer, only 60 kilos. And uh, people at that time were 10 centimeters shorter than today's. This is because uh, they were not well fed. Actually, he finds that the bottom 10% of the labor force lacked sufficient energy for regular work, and the next 10% had enough energy for less than three hours of light work daily. And uh, their short size and, and weight uh, was both a consequence and, um, of uh, undernourishment and what uh, helped people uh, just survive and work because had they been uh, uh, heavier like us today, uh, they wouldn't have been uh, able to afford the, the calories needed. So he concluded with this work that uh, the stark decline in death rates uh, throughout the 19th century was almost entirely due to improved nutrition which itself was due to progress in uh, agriculture technology. Um, it was not due to improvement in medicine. Actually, the um, antibiotics came uh, in the 20th century, and this was the, the big increase uh, in life expectancy brought by medicine. But it was not so much due to a better hygiene uh, so much, because he finds that um, in nutrition, explains much better uh, the reduction in the spread of infectious disease than uh, hygiene, a better hygiene. Any question? Yes? The question is, why are we interested in these uh, results? You're talking about the, the three points, or just the last one? The three ones? Um, yes, so, so both uh, they are interesting uh, by themselves, and um, they can be useful to think about uh, today. For example, the railroad story. Uh, you can think of, um, I mean, if railroads are important drivers of development, and uh, it's very capital intensive, so the, and it's very risky to build a railroad, so the private sector will not do it by itself. So, and actually, we see that in the 19th century and until today, uh, the public sector is uh, really uh, crucial in financing the development of railroads. Then you want to know if it's worth it to finance railroads or not. Um, so today it can apply in, in countries that don't have a lot of railroads. 
uh, but you can also uh, make a parallel between railroads uh, in the 19th century and uh, today's um, um, internet connection, inter like uh, internet availability uh, or uh, other kinds of uh, similar infrastructure. Um, for slavery, uh, the goal that uh, Fogel had in mind when he wrote the book was um, that he found that uh, African American uh, had uh, a sentiment that they are somehow martyr, martyr, and uh, this is because they thought that uh, uh, through uh, slavery uh, they they were badly mistreated, and uh, this gave them this uh, inferiority uh, sentiment. And he thought that by restoring the truth, uh, it would uh, change the morale of, um, of African American and help them uh, uh, improve their condition. It's, it's a weird uh, justification, I think. Um, but yeah, just a fun fact, Fogel's uh, wife was uh, a professor at Harvard and she was a black woman. So <laughs> he was not uh, racist, <laughs> at least. Um, but yeah, he had uh, some uh, ideas related to, to today's problem when he wrote the book. And uh, for nutrition, health, productivity, um, I think it's, it's relevant um, when we think of uh, like uh, what should we do with the limited amount of, of budget uh, to help uh, some poor countries like Haiti or some African countries. Uh, should we help them uh, developing the agriculture or uh, medicine? Uh, so, yeah, I don't know, but this can be interesting even for today's problems. You're welcome. Um, then uh, Douglas North, the, the second... Uh, academic historian, uh, Nobel Prize, worked on institutions. He defines institutions as humanly devised constraints that structure political, economic, and social interactions. So in institutions as constraints. And the constraints are devised either as formal rules, like legislation, or as informal restraints. Uh, sanctions, taboos, tradition, so informal uh, rules. The goal of constraints is to limit violence and to perpetuate order and safety. So this is the, the goal of institutions, according to him. And then um, he studies the very long run history through the viewpoint of uh, economic analysis. And uh, he explains how the society evolved, evolved from a village economy, uh, so very small scale uh, societies, to uh, the global civilization that uh, we know today. So in the village economy, uh, the production costs are high because there cannot be a high specialization. So um, there cannot be the type of specialization uh, of division of labor that we have in uh, the global uh, world where everyone does a very precise task. If your community is constituted of only 100 or even 1,000 people, uh, you cannot have, uh, by definition, more than 1,000 uh, different types of jobs. Um, so this limits uh, the specialization and increases production costs. But on the other hand, the transaction costs are low because everyone knows each other, so you don't have uh, to, to have uh, formal contracts uh, you don't really have to have um, uh, official uh, structures to um, judge conflicts because you can rely on uh, reputation and uh, on the bonds of trust and reciprocity between people and on informal sanctions and taboos. Uh, you just need a few uh, formal rules uh, to, uh, to avoid uh, problems. Now, uh, when villages start to trade with each other, uh, then um, 
it allows them to decrease the production cost because some village will spe specialize, let's say a, a coastal village will specialize in fishing and an healer village in uh, mining, and then they will trade the uh, fish against, uh, against uh, metal. But the transaction cost rises because, um, okay, you need to, to know that the fish uh, is, uh, is not too old, is of good quality. Uh, you need to know that the metal uh, is, um, is sufficiently pure and uh, that uh, the weight of the metal is um, as uh, much as expected. Uh, you need to have a safe transport of the good uh, between one village and the others. So you need some protections against uh, stealers, against uh, attackers. And um, you need uh, trade routes, uh, you need uh, contracts to, um, to, uh, to enforce uh, enforceable contracts, so you need an authority that uh, can enforce the contract and in the contract you need to specify what happens if uh, the contractor doesn't pay you, uh, if the, the good is not the quality you expected, etc. So resources are needed to ensure the good quality and enforce the terms of the trade. And this is a key role for institutions, is to reduce the, the cost, um, to disincentive uh, fraud and theft, maintain order and safety, and reduce the transaction costs. The problem is that decision makers structure the institutions to serve their own interests. So transaction costs are not minimized because you have to pay your rent to uh, the government, to the rulers. Um, now, the rulers uh, have an interest to maintain order to keep uh, their rent going. And, uh, and this is what creates some stable institutions. Are there questions? Now, North argues that the set of uh, institutions can evolve in a way favorable to development, and he distinguishes two kind of sets of institutions. The limited access orders, so these are a uh, uh, set of institutions that are controlled by the elite. The elite extracts rents and maintain orders, the order to do so. Okay, they have, yeah. This is the, the reason why they maintain order. It's uh, to protect their power. Uh, to, because if, um, if people uh, would feel unsafe, uh, if the, the security was not achieved, then they, they could overrule the, the rulers because this is the basic function that uh, they expect from the rulers. And then there are open access orders who limit the violence through a politically, politically controlled military. So this is the case in a modern uh, nation state. And uh, the idea of North is that open access orders emerge from limited access orders through uh, two mechanisms. The first one is the application of impersonal laws to elites. So, uh, for example, uh, in China, for uh, centuries, you have uh, the, the system of uh, competitive exams, uh, where the, 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 the few people that could uh, read, that were literate, were selected not because uh, of their ancestors, but because of their performance, because uh, they, they worked well, basically. Uh, so this is a, a way to uh, reduce the amount of privilege within the elite. And then the second mechanism is to extend the elite privileges to everyone in the society. So extending the privilege to all stimulates growth since the solution to economic problems, innovation can come from anyone because no one is preventing prevented access to uh, funding, uh, to uh, favorable regulation, and, and so on. Are there questions uh, here? Okay, so um, the conclusion is that institutions are key, and including informal institutions. 
institutions who, who that reward hard work and honesty will probably uh, uh, bring success to uh, the society uh, they are in, uh, with contrast to institutions that foster corruption. And um, we can analyze the success or failures of uh, the development in certain countries through the lenses of institution. For example, at the fall of the USSR, uh, everything was privatized from one day to the next uh, in a kind of chaotic way. And there was no institutions, either formal or informal. There was no um, habit uh, of um, contract law, of um, laws that enforced uh, property rights, um, of um, basically there was no uh, rule of law that would uh, make every business on uh, a level playing field. And because of this lack of institution, uh, very soon a few oligarchs were able to uh, um, obtain um, all the, the privatized resources and to dominate uh, the economic and political scene uh, at the expense of the, the country's uh, economic system. And so in ex-USSR countries, uh, the GDP decreased by uh, about 30% in the five years uh, following the fall uh, of the Soviet Union because the institutions were completely uh, destroyed. Um, and uh, on the positive side, uh, those African countries that grow uh, more are those with a strong rule of law, where the law is applied impartially by judges. And uh, actually, North argues that um, property rights, their enforcement in an impartial way, matters uh, a lot for development, uh, while liberalization doesn't matter that much. Uh, but liberalization is what is advocated by uh, international institutions like the IMF or the World Bank in the so-called Washington Consensus. Uh, they um, uh, push uh, low-income countries uh, to um, reduce tariffs, uh, to reduce uh, sometimes public spending, uh, to reduce the size of, of government uh, regulations, and so on, to, um, to liberalize in a world. Uh, but uh, this can have perverse effects if it means less resources for justice, uh, because often uh, custom duties, the tariffs, uh, is the the biggest uh, source of taxes from these states. So if you remove them, they have less budget for justice. So property rights are less well enforced and uh, this can prevent development instead of fostering it. Are there any questions? Yes? Uh, it's a different thing than open access orders. So the question is, is Washington consensus the, priv the prevailing views of uh, rich countries for development? I would say um, it was. Uh, it was in the 80s, 90s. Uh, now I think that, uh, that every, I mean, we, we've seen the consequences of uh, the application of these policies. So um, because of inertia, uh, the Washington consensus is still strong uh, in uh, the OECD, the IMF, uh, they, they still push for these types of policies, but it's, uh, it's not, um, it's not a, an hegemonous, uh, hegemonic view. Uh, even within the IMF, uh, the OECD, the, the World Bank, uh, there are a lot of voices against uh, the Washington consensus. So it's not a consensus anymore, I, I think. Um, now, it's different from uh, open access order versus limited access order. 
uh, because um, the Washington consensus are about liberal policies within open access orders. I think uh, there is a consensus uh, all over the world that open, open access orders are better than limited access orders. Um, because uh, because uh, limited access order it's uh, it's highly unequal because you have an elite that uh, that controls the military power the all power because when you control the military power you basically control the rest and uh, which can of course uh, extract rents to the rest of society for uh, their own benefit. Whether with limited access order, the military is uh, under check, uh, so you, there is room for a, a more fair society, even if it's not always the case. Um, yeah. Other questions? But um, yeah. Also, it's uh, yeah. I'm not sure if there are still uh, countries uh, with limited access orders uh, nowadays. Uh, maybe a few monarchy here and there, but um, but uh, but I think uh, most countries are uh, open access orders um, or or mixed when you have. Uh, when you have a dictator that, that controls absolutely uh, everything in the country, like it can happen in, uh, in some African countries, then it's in between. But, uh, but often you, you, you still have elections, you so it's, uh, it's in the process of uh, becoming an open access order. So, um, open access orders, by the way, doesn't necessarily mean uh, democracy. Democracy it just means that um, you don't have um, uh, that you have, uh, you don't have uh, an elite that uh, that has special special privileges somehow. Okay. Any other question? I'm going to switch to uh, the next lecture, which is uh, like the previous one. It's a bit of patchwork uh, between different things, and. Um, yeah, I also start with institutions on this one. So actually, I will start with a um, little game. So um, please go on, uh, on this address, slide.do slash 775-775. So the... Um, did I activate? Maybe I... Sorry. Does it work or not? No. Okay, sorry, I need to activate it. Uh, yeah. Okay, please reload. Um, so, um, the game is, the, is, is to study the strategy of the common. So, imagine that uh, you all receive 10 stars. So, the, the 10 stars like, that are here, and you love stars. So you want to end up with the highest number of stars uh, possible. Uh, now, you can put some or all of your stars in a common pool. It will be a common pool resources. Stars that are put in the pool reproduce by themselves so that they, their number doubles. And then, uh, after they have doubled, we share these uh, common stars equally among you. How many stars do you contribute? So your objective is just to uh, maximize the number of stars you will receive at the end. So if you keep all 10 stars, you will have 10 stars. If you put like uh, five stars in the common pot, um, you will obtain one star among these five because the five star will become, I uh, know oh because, okay, I have, I've assumed you were, you would be 10 because uh, in previous sessions you were 10. Um, so let's say you have, um, uh, yeah, but I think it's, it's, uh, it also works, just that the numbers are not uh, so neat. But, 
uh, yeah. So if you put uh, six stars uh, in the middle, uh, they will double, they will become 12, and uh, each of you will receive uh, uh, two stars from, uh, from these six stars. So if no one else puts the six stars, you, you lose uh, four stars, but if everyone puts six stars, then uh, you gain six stars. So what do you contribute? Have you answered or? Or do you have a question? Have you answered? Yes, everyone? Okay. So let me answer as well. Uh, okay, so two. Okay, so it's very diverse, but on average, people contribute four point three stars. All right. Uh, so. Um, so who put uh, one star in the pot? You? Yeah, I so but basically you win because uh, you free ride, you free road. And uh, so in total you, you have uh, your nine uh, first stars and then how many stars were put in the pot? So one, um, two times two, five, uh, five and three, eight, eight and five, 13. 20, 30, 30 divided, so five stars. So each one receives uh, five stars from the common pot. So uh, you have 14 stars. And uh, who put their 10 stars? Who is the generous one? You are? So uh, thank you. <laughs> so in the end, uh, you obtain uh, ten, uh, five stars, right? if I did the computation uh, correctly. Um, so uh, in this game, the generous people uh, lose and the selfish people win. Now we'll make a modified version of the game where uh, you will first, um, I let you 10 minutes, so I don't know uh, how, many, how much time you need to discuss uh, within you uh, some, uh, some rules. You can create any rules that you want between you and, uh, and it will be the same game in the end. Wait, what's the objective? The objective is to have the maximum number of stars for your own. You don't care about the others. You want to have uh, more stars uh, for you. But, uh, so like we just done, but, uh, but right now, so you can go on the side of the, of the room and discuss with each other. And the, the, the idea is to find some rules, uh, maybe to help you cooperate. So I mean, now the objective is different, right? The objective is the same. The objective is still, for you, the objective is to have the, more, the most uh, stars possible. Yeah, exactly. So collectively, your your interest will be. But uh, but as before, before the the collectively, it was also better that everyone contribute uh, ten. Uh, but uh, but what changes now is that you are allowed to discuss before. Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> so, um, so the so the guy who uh, introduced the tragedy of the commons is uh, Hardin in '68, and he states that uh, rational, self-interested people will deplete common pool resources uh, because they don't care uh, <clears throat> the, of the, the negative externality it has on the others. But uh, Elinor Holstrom did um, uh, field work in a lot of different places and read the literature that uh, did field work and uh, she observed that uh, communities manage uh, such resources uh, efficiently in general. So groundwater, fisheries, forest. So she disproved uh, this view uh, in her book, uh, Governing the Commons, The Evolution of Institution for Collective Action. Uh, so then uh, we say that there is a, a, the Ostrom theorem that uh, if, it works, if it can work in practice, then it can work in theory. And, uh, and then she, she devised, uh, like, why does it work? Why uh, don't we have the tragedy of the commons in practice? Uh, so first she insists that uh, the solutions to uh, a problem of managing a common pool resource uh, are case specific. And so she warns against uh, panaceas, so solutions that would work everywhere. Um, she praises institutional diversity. She thinks that uh, the communities should uh, have the power to define the rules of the games themselves. And this will naturally create uh, different rules depending on the community. Uh, and this can be uh, optimal. Um, so she finds usual uh, characteristics in the efficient arrangements uh, because, okay, sometimes she, she finds that the common pool resources are efficiently managed, but someone's, sometimes not. And so she was able to, to find out what uh, common characteristics uh, we find when they are efficiently managed. And you'll see that uh, you have applied uh, most, uh, if not all, of uh, these uh, characteristics. And this is why you obtained the efficient, uh, the Pareto uh, efficient allocation. So users can make their own rules. Uh, they can monitor the, each other. Uh, so this is why you needed to, to check uh, who had voted what in the end. Uh, there is graduated sanction. So a uh, small sanction for a first uh, infringement and then a uh, larger sanction if uh, there is a recidive, etc. And conflict resolution mechanisms. Uh, so you didn't have a conflict resolution mechanisms because you, you trusted uh, each other uh, enough. Uh, perhaps by, because there wasn't a, a big stake because as you said, uh, if you lose, you just lose imaginary stars. So it doesn't really matter. But you had uh, devised your own rules, you had monitoring, and you had uh, sanctions, uh, which is uh, paying beer to the others. And um, so the method of Ostrom was to go back and, fo and forth between uh, observation directly in the field and experimental confirmation of hypothesis in the lab. So she would observe how a community manage uh, groundwater uh, in a suburb of Les, uh, Los Angeles where there is uh, uh, problems of water scarcity. Uh, she would uh, hypothesize that uh, the common pool resources is well managed if these uh, um, uh, characteristics are present. And then she would go in the lab, do exactly what we did, uh, make people play in the lab, and um, remove or add one characteristic at a time uh, to show that indeed uh, such characteristics uh, were important and such uh, not. So she found that uh, in the lab that there were even more over harvesting, for example pumping of water, than the theory predicted when the decisions were anonymous and without communication. But that face-to-face -face communication which is uh, called cheap talk in the sense that uh, it's not enforced by a higher authority, uh, because here you could have lied to the others. You could have even said, yes, uh, okay, I will bring beers in two weeks and not uh, bring the beer, right? So it's cheap talk in this sense. Um, 
but uh, it, it worked. In the theory, it, it didn't work, but in practice, it worked and increases cooperation. And full optimi optimality is achieved thanks to the self-devised sanctionary system. So uh, she developed the, the theory uh, even more uh, through the Institutional Analysis and Development Framework, which is a common framework to analyze uh, rigorously any institution, any uh, social arrangement. Um, she, so in her observations, she also finds that property rights is more complex than just prop, like uh, one given property right and can be uh, differentiated in at least five different types of property right. The right to access the good, the, the, the right to withdraw, so for example for the groundwater, is the, ac the, the right to, uh, to, to, go to, the, to go to the lake, or to the, to re the withdrawal right is to pump, Management is to the right to take decisions. Uh, exclusion is the right to exclude someone uh, from accessing, so to, to build a barrier or some, something. And alienation, which uh, itself uh, covers, uh, comprises several rights. The right to sell, the right to uh, donate, and the right to destroy the good. And uh, property rights, we often think only of alienation, but there are these other rights, um, and um, you can, uh, because there are different property rights, you can have only limited property rights. You can have the right of managing uh, something, but not the right to sell it, or vice versa. Uh, all of her work was very collaborative. For example, she launched a global network on uh, forest research so that uh, many researchers around the world apply the same methods uh, to analyze uh, how forests are managed, uh, but in a non-hierarchical uh, way. So they, they collaborate with each other, share their results, but work independently of each other. And she built a, a research center, I think it's in uh, the University of Arizona, uh, that is non-hierarchical as well, so there is no compulsory lectures. Uh, there is participative workshops instead. So there are free interactions between students and, and professors. And, uh, and someone says, okay, today I'm going to, talk, uh, to give a talk about this and those who, who want to come, come, etc." cetera. Uh, yes, and she was the first uh, woman to get the Nobel Prize. Uh, the second one being uh, Esther Duflo in development economics. We'll talk about her in two weeks or three. Any question? Um, okay, let me talk about Gunnar uh, Myrdal in the last uh, four minutes. Um, and we'll be done about uh, institutions. So he's a, a Swedish economist who uh, became famous uh, because he introduced expectations in his PhD. Uh, in, the, in the 20s, he introduced the idea that uh, expectations about the future were important in the way people take decisions and so should be integrated uh, in economic uh, thinking and modeling. Uh, with the Swedish uh, school, uh, the Stockholm School, he developed a theory close to the Keynesian theories. Um, for example, uh, he noted that uh, when you close, when a factory closes in uh, a town, it entails a cascading effects um, because um, it's, uh, so many people are fired, so they consume less, and by the multiplier effect, um, investment is reduced in this area because uh, shops, uh, other firms know that uh, uh, consumption will be low. And uh, in the end, people flee from the area, less people work, uh, more people are unemployed, so the um, revenues collected by uh, the town uh, decrease and the uh, social spending increases. Um, uh, so there are problems uh, of, of, of funding um, public uh, goods, etc. So it's a snowball effect that depresses the area. 
uh, which is a justification to be very wary against uh, the closure of certain uh, big plans. He was a social democrat, member of the parliament, and uh, was uh, very important in establishing uh, the Swedish welfare state uh, in the 50s, throughout the, the 70s. So the Swedish model is the idea that uh, the country is, the, is a big, like a big family uh, that um, looks after one another and, uh, and helps uh, each other. And it's a compromise between uh, uh, unregulated capitalism and socialism, basically. Uh, that was a very successful um, model of social democracy. He criticized the idea of a stable equilibrium that dominates in economics and developed instead the notion of circular cumulative causation. It's the idea of the snowball effect. Let me quote him uh, extensively. What is wrong with the stable equilibrium assumption as applied to social reality is the very idea that a social process follows a direction, though it might move towards in it in a circuitous way, follows a direction towards a position which in some sense or other can be described as a, sa as a state of equilibrium between forces. Behind this idea is another and still more basic assumption namely that a change will regularly call forth a reaction in the system in the form of changes which on the whole go in the opposite direction to the first change. I think it's, uh, the style is, is not so good, but it um, says that uh, the idea be be behind the, the stable equilibrium assumption is that there will be uh, balancing uh, forces uh, in reaction to a, a force. The idea I want to expand in this book is that, on the contrary, in the normal case, there is, not, there is no such a tendency towards automatic self-stabilization in the social system. The system is by itself not moving towards any sort of balance between forces, but is constantly on the move away from such a situation. In the normal case, a change does not call forth countervailing changes, but instead supporting changes, which move the system in the same direction as the first change, but much further. Because of such circular causation, as a social process tends to become cumulative and often gather speed at an accelerating rate. He developed um, this theory in a um, very influential work, uh, like uh, more than a thousand page a report that was ordered by uh, the US government to study the race uh, question in the US. And he, ex he studied it uh, extensively, uh, collecting uh, insights from many disciplines, and uh, developed this theory of circular cumulative causation with the example of the discrimination uh, that uh, African Americans face. Because the idea is that uh, because of slavery, they started uh, poorer uh, with uh, less education. And uh, this um, somehow justified prejudices against them from uh, the white, uh, because um, on average, uh, a black person would be uh, less educated uh, than a white, so you'd prefer to, to hire a white. Uh, but this in turn make uh, the, the African-American population uh, poorer. Um, um, uh, with less access to education, uh, more prone to, to, to violence because um, they, they can, uh, more prone to, 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 to drugs, uh, etc., because uh, they, they, they don't have a place in society, uh, which reinforces uh, the discrimination against them, etc. His study uh, was cited uh, in the decision by the Supreme Court um, in the 50s uh, to end segregation. And uh, from uh, his study, um, I mean, his study inspired uh, many subsequent policies in favor of, um, uh, I mean, uh, of racial integration of African American, uh, like affirmative action uh, or things like that. Because he said the way to break the, the, the vicious circle is uh, for the white community to show that black people are welcome uh, for, through, for example, the symbol of affirmative action. 
and in Beyond the Welfare State, he defended a welfare world. So in his noble uh, lecture, he, uh, so because he was also a, an economy, a development economist, uh, he criticized that uh, people lacked uh, morality uh, and that if people were more moral, uh, the US would spend less on the military and on uh, beef or, or meat, and they would spend more on, uh, on foreign aid. And uh, he was calling uh, to, to make at the global level the kind of uh, redistribution that was happening successfully uh, within a country like Sweden. This is the idea of welfare world beyond the welfare state. Thank you very much and see you next week.